Hi, everybody. If you had been here for the last 10 minutes where Fluffy had been hanging around tonight and we thought, oh, he's decided that he wants to join. And Chocolate was already sitting down underneath the table in front of me and everything was just so peaceful and wonderful. And then it's just his personality. He is the most loving, lovable clown you could ever, ever live around. And he loves to play games. And he took off. Brad tried to get him because I was all miked and Chocolate was waiting. Well, for the last, what, five minutes, it was down to, because I really wanted Fluffy to be with us tonight. A lot of you have been saying, hey, it's been three weeks with chocolate. Where's Fluffy? I completely agree. And if you were here all the way around, you would know that this little guy, he's all of our bosses. I have never lived with an animal. He totally is the best alarm clock I've ever had every single morning at 7 a.m. on the dot, like he's got a clock right inside of him, what he does is he sort of gently jumps on my back or my leg, and he has a very specific sound, and it's sort of a meow, like it's time to get up. And when Fluffy is ready to go, you cannot resist him. And then Chocolate, Chocolate is the guy who is a constant companion wherever I go. And Fluffy will then turn around and pounce on chocolate to turn it into a game, to turn it into, and they go skittering across the floor. And I've told Brad, we've got to spend a day with a camera trying to document these guys the way they really are. But I just wanted you to know, we really tried hard tonight Fluffy is here, the boss is here, and he is truly one of the most amazing little animals that I've ever been with. He really, really has a sense of the world around him, and he wants everything to go just exactly the way that he wants it to go. I love him. And Chocolate, Chocolate is the mystical one. Chocolate is the one who can stare and seems to be telepathic and I love you both and I'm so glad you were here Fluffy and for those who wanted to see Fluffy I'm going to try to lift up <laughs> here we go look at how big he is he was the runt of the litter can you believe it look at how he has grown look at this guy how big he is and chocolate, remember it was about a month ago that I walked in the door so you could see how big chocolate is. He's just absolutely amazing character. And I love you both so much. Mm. Now I'm going to talk with the people. So we got Fluffy. Finally, once a month we may, depends upon uh, how much we struggle with him. Well, there is at least a little good news. For the first time since early December of 2019, China's rising COVID-19 pandemic cases and deaths seem to finally top out last week. Wuhan, China's first and worst infected area, where it all began, reported on Monday, March 23rd, that it had gone five straight days without new cases. If that's any guide for us in the United States, we will have four nightmare months to go until July 2020. But the cases have continued to pile up around the world. And you can see from these figures, today, the coronavirus cases in the world, 467,351. The deaths, 21,166. And the recoveries, 113,808. And that was as of 7 p.m. Mountain Time tonight, uh, about a half hour before we started the broadcast. 
Now, uh, it's to me, it, this has been the most important thing we could do is to quarantine. And I think that based on China, that we will have four nightmare months to go until July of 2020. And we will all be challenged with staying at home in self-quarantine throughout America, as some parts of the nation, like New York City, are experiencing doubling and tripling of cases every two to three days. That's the big red circle up there on the far upper right. That's New York. Now, tonight at 7 p.m. before the broadcast, the United States total cases had risen to 65,797 and 935 deaths. If China's General Secretary Xi had not ordered the mandatory lockdown of at least 100 million people in Wuhan and the surrounding region on January 23rd for two full months, the pandemic deaths there would have been much greater than what they reported today on March 25th, 2020, 3,287 deaths. We also learned this week from German scientists that COVID-19 can cause the loss of smell and taste. So these are different symptoms to watch out for. Professor Hendrik Streeck, center in this photo, is director of the Institute of Virology in Bonn, Germany. On March 10th, he and his team traveled 65 miles northwest of Bonn to Heinsberg, a town of about 40,000 people, where there were several confirmed COVID cases. The doctors walked door to door to talk directly to sick people. They collected many samples, including toilet waters, and discovered that one woman cleaning her apartment could not even smell the bleach. Another person was cooking garlic on the stove, but could not smell or taste the garlic. One mother could not smell the soiled diaper of her baby. So now doctors around the world are asking people who suddenly lose their ability to taste or smell to keep away from everyone for at least seven days waiting for more COVID symptoms or maybe not, which might help slow down the pandemic spread. President Trump keeps bringing up malaria fighting drugs that he thinks will help solve the pandemic crisis, such as chloroquine phosphate, prescribed to treat malaria, lupus, and arthritis. There is also this version, hydroxychloroquine, known as Plaquenil. Will these anti-malaria, anti-lupus, anti-arthritis drugs help fight COVID-19? confusion about what they might or might not be able to do was highlighted in two contradictory headlines on Monday, March 23rd. A 52-year-old Florida man was hospitalized with COVID-19 in the intensive care unit of a South Florida hospital for more than a week. He could barely breathe or speak, and he called friends and family to say goodbye before he knew that he was going to die. But a friend told him to ask for hydroxychloroquine. The hospital said, okay, and gave him the pills. And when he woke up the next morning, he was able to breathe again. So that is a positive outcome. But at the same time came this March 23rd Forbes headline, Man dead from taking chloroquine after Trump touts drug for coronavirus. A healthy and thriving 68-year-old man in Arizona has died after swallowing a small amount of chloroquine phosphate in hopes that it would prevent getting COVID-19. His 61-year-old wife also took chloroquine phosphate and she is hospitalized in critical condition. What did the healthy couple do to end up this way? The couple had koi fish, and the wife treated the koi with chloroquine. When she heard Trump's announcement that the anti-malarial drug could help fight COVID-19, the couple mixed one teaspoon of chloroquine phosphate with soda and drank it. Forbes reports that, quote, 
Within 20 minutes, the woman began vomiting and her husband had trouble breathing, close quote. The woman called paramedics and the couple was admitted to a hospital where the husband died soon afterward. It was only two days before, on March 21st, last week, a Philippine infectious disease doctor and molecular biologist, Etzel Savana, PhD, tweeted an important message highlighted between the red lines in his tweet. Quote, please don't take hydroxychloroquine, which is placanil, plus azithromycin for COVID-19, unless your doctor prescribes it. Both drugs affect the QT interval of your heart and they can lead to arrhythmias and sudden death, especially if you are taking other meds or you have a heart condition, close quote. Will COVID-19 stop spreading in the heat of July to August? University of Utah physicist Michael Veshinin, PhD, and physicist Xavier Severian, PhD, have just received a nearly $200,000 National Science Foundation grant to study how the COVID-19 coronavirus's hard outer protective shell, shown here in the pale green, responds to changes in heat and humidity. Coronaviruses are not able to function on their own as we think of Earth life, minds and brains. The coronaviruses don't have brains. They are simply shells with RNA genetic instructions inside those protective shells and the part that is the software, so to speak, is shown here in blue. The coronavirus is only one twenty thousandth of a millimeter in size, and it has only one goal, to invade host cells and then to insert genetic instructions to take over the host cell's ability to replicate. And then COVID-19 starts making as many copies of itself as possible. The idea, the scientists say, is to now figure out what makes this virus fall apart, what makes it tick, and what makes it die, close quote. Further, Harvard epidemiologists have been studying humidity and heat impacts on the coronavirus and report that COVID-19 likely is not just going to go magically away. It could flare up, in fact, this upcoming fall and winter. Some medical experts are already warning there could be multiple waves of illness over the next 18 months into 2021 until a vaccine is available to immunize human populations. So sheltering in place might be the new normal for several months to come. Okay, let's leave some of our worries about the microscopic threats on Earth, and let's jump way out to the farthest edge of our Milky Way galaxy. Astronomers have found the edge of the Milky Way at last. This is a new image of our Milky Way galaxy produced by the Fermi Space Telescope. The red and yellow are from imaging in gamma ray frequencies. The blue egg is dark matter that surrounds the glowing matter and does not emit light. That's why until now there was never a measurement out to the very edge of our galaxy. But now Elise Deason, an astrophysicist at Durham University in England, has reported at Cornell University's archive that the precise diameter of our galaxy edge to edge is 1.9 million light years. Astrophysicist Deason reports, quote, the edge of the stars is very sharp, almost like the stars just stop at a particular radius. And our Milky Way galaxy is only one of an estimated two trillion galaxies in the observable universe that is 13.8 billion light years to the event horizon. And each universe could have an average of 100 billion stars per galaxy. That's 2 trillion times 100 billion. And that 
is one septillion stars. A septillion is a one followed by 24 zeros, a trillion trillion. That is how big our universe is, this one that we are in. And then when we go back to Earth and more strange unexplained sounds, there's been one yesterday in Sweden. It was 12.30 a.m., March 24th in Orebro, Sweden's sixth largest city west of Stockholm. Samia Nasser is a 46-year-old IT professional who was waked from sleep to feel her entire body vibrating. She said she couldn't understand what was happening, but she could also hear a sound unlike anything she had ever experienced before. She jumped out of bed, grabbed her cell phone, and headed for the deck outside of her upstairs bedroom. For three minutes, she recorded what was in front of her, a totally quiet parking lot, meaning nothing is moving, silent cars, darkness. Nothing explained the haunting, almost choral-like sounds around her. I talked with her by phone, and she said other people around her in the apartment complex told her they had been awakened as well by the mysterious sounds, but they went back to sleep. Here now, with her permission, is an excerpt of Samia's cell phone video recording that she posted on her YouTube channel yesterday. As these peculiar, eerie, choral-like sounds have accumulated over the past decade from all over the world, I have often received questions about whether there could be non-human intelligences coming and going on Earth to other parts of our solar system, the Milky Way galaxy, other galaxies, other timelines, beyond in those two trillion galaxies. And could such interstellar travel also include advanced technologies that transport from Earth to other dimensions and timelines, other universes, as some people in the human abduction syndrome have been told, that some of what they deal with is literally moving dimensions? If any of that were a reality, why is it that it was the year 2011 in all of my work that seems to be when a worldwide persistent start of reports of mysterious loud booms, the crashing of metal, choruses of trumpets, and voice sounds sort of like the Sweden choral recording. Some abductees describe other intelligences in conflict with each other. Could the strange sounds for the past 10 years have come from some kind of an advanced battle where time and space and matter are manipulated by frequencies? Could there be wars where vibrations and sounds are the residue of the weapons or are the weapons? After last week's Earth Files YouTube live stream, I received an email from a viewer who was warned by a blonde Nordic being that there is an ancient conflict between the Nordic ETs who say they want to protect Earth humans for some unknown reason versus another alien intelligence that does not like humans 
and that the reasons for why they don't like us is not given. Here is the email from, I'm just using the initials, M.B. to Linda Moulton Howe. It's concerning, he says, my meeting with the Nordic. Date, March 20th, 2020. Dear Linda, my YouTube name is Marin. I have seen a Nordic being, and here is what I remember. It was in 1973. I was 15 years old, born in 1958. I was raised on a small farm in mid-Michigan. By age 15, I had my own bedroom, and one night I was awakened by a bright light on the right side of the bed. The light was very bright, and it illuminated me and the side of my bed, but nothing else in the room. I got up and sat on my bed toward the light. The light slowly turned into a hologram-like image. What I was looking at looked 3D, yet was also like a viewer screen as well. I turned around to look at my illuminated alarm clock to assure that I wasn't dreaming this. The clock read 12.15 a.m. I even watched the second hand sweeping its way around for a few seconds. I turned back to the image, which turned into a female dressed in white and blue silky material. And he provided this image to me after I had asked him if he could draw or sketch her. And he said, I went on the web and this was the closest I could find to who was standing in front of me. And he continues his email. She was absolutely incredibly beautiful. And she had very large human-like blue eyes. They were larger than a human normal size, but still human in appearance. She appeared to be sitting on a throne-like chair. Others have said Nordics appear small in stature, but the one that visited me seemed very tall. When her image became clear, she spoke to me telepathically and used similar hand motions to calm me. Don't be afraid, she said. I am not here to harm you. Though she spoke telepathically, she often smiled and her eyes blinked and looked at and around me. I also saw her bare hands, but no other skin except her neck area and head. Her gown was long enough in the 3D image to cover her feet if she had them. I remember most of the words that she said, and MB quotes her as a telepathic voice in his mind who said, I know you may feel this is strange, but please don't be alarmed. I am here to talk to you. I want nothing from you. I am Tertertian. I am from the Pleiades stars. I am on a mission to make contact to friendly people like you. My colleagues and I have been visiting your people for many years, but only to a few that we can trust. I have been watching you since you were born. You were selected to be one of our friendly contacts. There are many unfriendly species in the universe who only want to take control of whatever they can find. They have already made themselves at home on your world and have made contact with your leaders. They cannot be trusted. You must avoid them at all costs. We have been against them for a long time as they try to keep us from contact with you. I have found my way in to see you. Although it seems I am there with you, I am not. It is only my projection. I cannot stay with you long as they, the ones in conflict, the ones she says we cannot trust. They will attempt to disrupt my connection to you. I will try to make another contact with you in your future, perhaps in about five of your years. Please keep my visit with you to yourself, no matter who asks of it. 
If I can, I will return. I know you have a lot of questions for me, but I cannot stay with you long enough to answer. Just be assured that we are for you, not against you. We will protect you as well as we can. And this fits into a concept that some of what is trying to help us may come from another timeline or dimension and other things try to block. And then he completes the email. She vanished like a light being turned off. I went over to the place where she had just been, still wondering what I saw. And then I looked out my window into the night sky, nothing out of the ordinary. I went back to bed but could not sleep. I was taking in what she said and how she said it into my head and not from her mouth. I was still wondering how real it was. It wasn't until years later that I learned that a few others have met with Nordic beings. I was never visited again by her or anyone or anything else and don't know if she tried to come back five years later. But I am convinced 47 years after that night in 1973 in Michigan that it was real. And now I'm going to pick up, this was my uh, second book. This is the first volume of Glimpses of Other Realities. And it's becoming fascinating to me how much work I did in the 80s and then putting this book out in 1993 to 94, followed by volume two in 1998, that how much in these books now is more relevant, seems to be being reinforced in more directions than anything I could ever have guessed or known, known back then. And I'm turning to Human Abductions and Eyewitnesses. It is a, a big chapter in this volume one. Uh, in many ways, this book has a kind of taxonomy that evolved from all of the colored illustrations that I asked people that I was interviewing to provide to me. And there are dozens and dozens from people all over, none of them knowing each other. And in this chapter, Human Inductions and Eyewitnesses, it goes into a fascinating case by a, a young woman at the time, her name was Jean Robinson. And it was fascinating then, and it is now fascinating after getting the email about the Nordic being and the increasing numbers that I have been getting where people, there's more discussions. I went into Arowana Allen's uh, recently where she was dealing with tall Nordics Greys, praying mantises, it was the whole group. Well, this perspective of Jean Robinson, back when I worked with her, she was 36 year old at the time and she was a single mother. And she had uh, encountered animal mutilations in Missouri where she lived, as well as what was happening to her. And she was being abducted on a persistent basis and the way she described the first were a skeleton with large dark eyes that would end up standing at the foot of her bed and she would wake up and see them there. And when she did her drawings, they fell sort of into the category of what we would call the grays. And it involved being gynecological exams. And uh, by the time that she reached out, to people and they reached out to me. She said to me in Missouri, because I was there with her for some time, uh, she th said, I think I'm losing my mind. I asked her about the various types because it was grays, it was praying mantis, it was a variety of sizes. And what did she know about the Nordic type? Now, what is interesting is her information came through the praying mantis. And she, like others, have, have the impression 
wherever they're in front of them, that the praying mantis is somehow in charge of everything that is happening, no matter what other beings are there. And this is from my book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 1, Facts and Eyewitnesses. Quote from Gene Robinson uh, back in the early, uh, this was in fact uh, a, tele a transcript in 1990. Quote, the beings whom you describe, meaning the praying mantis is talking to Gene as an abductee about the blondes. The beings whom you describe as the Nordics have been among your people for many thousands of years. Their early settlements on your world gave them the opportunity to create a lasting coexistence with the humans. They are your early ancestors. Because of this genetic implantation, they can work and study your humankind with little fear of detection. Their goals are different from ours, meaning the praying mantis and the greys. We need your kind, humans, to survive. We must use your genetics to reproduce. The blonde ones have maintained their sexual abilities. They are more concerned with your spiritual evolvement. They are of an emotional, more gentle race. Their nature baffles us the praying mantises, as much as the unrestrained emotional behavior of you humans. However, we coexist together in the study of you and your people, many times contacting the same individuals over and over who are the subjects of study. Several of the telepathic communications that you have received are from the blonde ones that you call Nordics. They share the knowledge of communication through the biological transceivers of your brain. You will know which type of message has come from our kind, the praying mantises. We prefer to share the more technological implications of our contact. The praying mantis and the greys are known for putting the movies through the, uh, like the mind's eye. The blonde ones will answer the inquiries that concern spiritual understanding as it relates to universal concepts. These Nordics have told some of your kind that they are from the Pleiades. They originate from this region but they prefer secrecy as to the specific location of the solar system that they come from. And I've run into that before, where there does seem to be a common thread throughout history uh, that the importance the Pleiades have played in other civilizations that it may be that it ties to the interaction of the blondes coming and going. Now, the the praying mantises, uh, they did and said that in their study, that they look at the intricate design of molecular substructures of DNA composition. And they are looking for very specific deficiencies and positive traits and physical types and that genetic splicing of individual chromosomes within DNA matrix is used to eliminate unfavorable traits and physical flaws so that they can make a stronger race. The improved product, product can then pass on advanced biological systems to future generations, which will effectively evolve your species. Genetic alteration increases intellectual capacity of a larger percentage of the brain than the amount currently in use of your species. By choosing the chromosomes which control the areas of specific interest, it is possible to achieve varied results. 
while the lifespan could be lengthened tenfold. If it's an average of 70 years now, they could make it 700 years long. They say it is not advised. That is, until your kind can adequately provide for the needs of the population already in existence on your planet. Now, I've thought a lot about that working on this show today. The Nordics, the blondes, the, even the praying mantis saying that their emphasis with us is spiritual, having to do with the soul. And what is it that the praying mantis and the greys and even the reptilians, what is it that they want? What is it that they are doing genetically that sounds like a program in which it is the praying mantis that has been overseeing the evolution of standing of primates more. But there's no clarity about what exactly they want. I remember in the Arowana Allen, the big room of all the tubes of all of the bodies that were human and were uh, tall Nordics and tall red hairs and black hairs and all kinds. Their bottom line to Linda Porter and, and to uh, Arowana Allen was that it was important in the work that they were doing that the soul entity remain in certain specific human body types for a very specific period of time and that if disease or an accident were going to shorten that by death, they would intervene, transfer the soul energy into one of those preserved bodies in the tube technology. And as they said, place that one man who came from uh, the upper Michigan area into Australia so he would never cross his family. They would have the funeral for him in the Michigan area, but he would continue his monitored life in Australia by the praying mantis, the greys, uh, and apparently by some of the tall beings, still for reasons that are not clear. And so tonight, even though I'm not answering because I don't have answers, what I am beginning to see and feel in all of the work is how much I have done in the books, the documentaries, that are beginning to echo and resonate even more now with current cases that are coming to me only in March of 2020, like this experience with a beautiful blonde female that goes all the way back to 1976, but means more today and the man reaches out because he remembers it vividly and her words are haunting, that she comes from someplace in the Pleiades and wants to be closer to us on the earth, but there is something that keeps them blocked and that the, she could find a way, which sounds like other words in abduction cases that I have studied, where they talk about, we can be with you only for a period of time. We opened a portal. We can come and be here only for a little period of time. We, have, we don't have time, but we will try to return. What is that all about? And who, which ones are blocking? If we had the answers to that, we might have answers to a lot of issues about who we are and why we are and why there are wars on this planet and seem to be that they've gone on for so long. And there may be beings out there that have wanted to come and teach us and make us peaceful. And they're blocked. Who could do the blocking? Why would they do the blocking? 
your mind immediately goes to the reptilians. But she didn't say that. It's a very, very confusing 16-layered chess game. Who is really controlling? So now, on that, Peggy, let's see what kind of comments and questions we might have for the next 15 or 20 minutes. Hi, Linda. First, I, if I could have a moment just to explain that Super Chats, for those who don't catch yeah. the show live, Super Chats are when people donate funds through our live chat. Uh, and just in case you're wondering what the names are that I'm reading off here. Yeah, I saw that email, I think it was today, where uh, somebody asked, uh, could you please explain the uh, Super Chats and how they work? And uh, if I understand, uh, it is, what is it, a combination of wanting to contribute to the work, but it also gives priorities in people uh, getting questions to you, Peggy, and you selecting the questions that come to me. I think they're just mainly donations um, because we try to pick questions based on the merit of what is happening with your show. Okay. And sometimes uh, people ask week and week again. So I try to prioritize when I can. All right. Thank you. And uh, thank you for super chats, you guys. So let's uh, thank some people tonight. Cat Chaser, David Goldridge, Mike Martin, Katia Perez, David Lamour, Moonbird, Kiki Dombrowski, Terry M. Hart, Douglas Jones, Isabella Pachetti, Lightning, Will I Am Robin, Exodasha, and Gigi. Thank you, everyone. Wow. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I have a great question from somebody. Uh, they're wondering are Nordics the same as Pleiadians? Yes, I believe in the taxonomy of uh, the last 70 years that most everybody would agree that Pleiadian and Nordic have been interchangeable in the abduction literature and uh, like contacts. Uh, a contactee is different from an abductee in this regard. There are people like uh, Adamski going back into the 50s, the early 60s, uh, that the way he described it, there were these blonde, Nordic-looking people. Uh, I think at one time he talked about two visiting him, and he uh, allegedly saw their feet leaving tracks, uh, like they were matter beings, and that the tracks of those blonde beings had some kind of patterns on them. And in that case, Adamski was describing an interface like you and I or anybody, we would be talking with each other in contact directly, therefore contactee. The abduction or experiencer category, historically people were referred to in the beginning as human abductees. And then there was an evolution through the work of Dr. John Mack and Bud Hopkins and others, where uh, sometimes they felt that if you said abductees, it would always sound frightening, so it should be changed to experiencers. And I, I have no problem. Uh, it's, it, you, you find so many uh, contradictions and complexities whether you are interviewing somebody who has had face-to-face -face contact or somebody who has had missing time or they have waked up in their room and, and they have been afraid because there's somebody at their bed, but then they are, uh, t they are taken out of consciousness. That's where missing time comes in. And then under hypnosis, the work that John Mack and Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs and Leo Sprinkle and, and uh, the Opus, uh, the group Opus that in, uh, they were in California, and uh, what the work, the wonderful work that Kathleen Marden does with MUFON, 
oh wow, uh, trying to help people understand what has happened and that the concept of missing time, at one level, it does seem like really seriously troubling. And Bud Hopkins, uh, I think he felt that, that it was a negative. And you could say if we're dealing with non-humans who like the beautiful blonde communicated, we, we are not here to harm you. We are here because we want to protect you. There's contradictions all over the place. Um, if they're advanced enough to project holograms, because that's what that would have been the interpretation in her place, and that has been reinforced by so many scientists that I have talked to who say that the three main categories of technology that they would say that our scientists have had their hands on, have tried to understand, and that uh, in one sentence that some of what we're dealing with could be a thousand years advanced of us. One of those that they say that non-humans have been using so well are 3D holograms. Holograms so perfect that the, that the door could be a projected hologram and that humans would never understand anything, any part of their environment could be a sophisticated three-dimensional hologram downloading and uploading information anywhere on the planet. So 3D holography and that the technologies are then used to place somebody at the foot of your bed or by the side of your bed. There may not be anything organic or solid there. It may be it is a holographic projection. <coughs> and I remember one especially interesting case when John Lear and Bob Lazar and a group of us uh, had met uh, with some people and one of the men uh, had had a, an experience where he had been waked up at night and could see what he thought was an alligator standing to the left of his bed. And he said, I was scared to death but something in me made me jump up because I wanted to look right into the eyes of this alligator by my bed. He said, I don't know what made me do that either. But I'll never forget, and he said, Linda, I'm standing right in front of this. And I could see through the head to the dresser against my wall. And if I could see through this and I could see the dresser, it means this is a hologram. So these are some of the complexities and insights that we have all evolved to become more sophisticated in realizing that not everything that is an abduction is dealing with something that is physically matter there. It could be like the blonde, a holographic projection, but clearly people are taken. Things are done to their bodies and then they are returned. And some people who prefer to be called, they call themselves experiencers. They say it's the same as we would take a, our cat to the vet for a shot. The shot is important to keep the cat well and alive, but we can't explain to the cat what we're doing. And the, a lot of the people who prefer to be called experiencers say, that they have gained a lot from their interactions with some of the advanced intelligences, and they have come to understand that in some cases they've even been treated with something that took away a cancer or, or some health problem. So the landscape is a little clearer, but the clearer it becomes, it's way more complicated. And if any of you out there have your own experiences with the Nordics, the Blondes. That is, in many ways, the most enigmatic group. I would love to know. And if anybody has had ex an experience or a contactee who thinks that they also have a more evolved insight into what could be happening 
Is it possible that we're now in a century where these beings knew what was going to happen when 2020 clicked on the clock? There were all kinds of advanced statements in the last four or five years coming from a variety of people. When we get to 2020, it's really going to be rough on planet Earth. Who saw this? Who knew this? Are we dealing with beings who already know the whole rest of the century? There's, there are suggestions that that may be. And what is it then that the governments might know that the rest of us don't? And if there was one positive at this juncture on March 25th, 2020, it is how many humans on the planet, no matter what the country, who are seeing other human beings who are nurses and doctors who are putting their lives on the line for us. I'm just praying every day to what I call the divine field that this new surge, the humans deserve to live, that we are worth fighting for, will come out of this horror of COVID-19. I pray every single one of you that you are staying someplace safe and that no matter what is being said politically, that you will stay and you will choose, choose, not look at it as imprisonment. You will choose to stay in place, in a house, in an apartment, wherever you are, for another two to three even four weeks, depending upon how many cases are around you where you live. And you will do so knowing that there will come a downside to all of this, but that there isn't any reason why we can't gut this out and continue to stay quarantined ourselves until the numbers in the United States start really going down again and that we won't feel perhaps ever quite as disconnected as we have been politically for the last three or four years. I guess what I'm feeling right now and say to all of you straightforwardly, I have felt tears in my soul I have wanted to cry every day because it all seems like such a horrible, horrible waste. And yet, if we look at what we're all going through, and if we get through it and we come out on the other side, maybe all of us on the planet will be a little kinder. And that would be really good. I really, truly love you, fellow humans. And I'll look forward to seeing you next week.